All right. Well, let's deal then with a Charlie Brown Christmas lesson. Uh, I hope the title of this morning's lesson, uh, you see the lightheartedness in this. Because, again, I just want to have some fun this morning dealing with Luke chapter 2 and uh, the Christmas story as uh, Charlie Brown and Linus told it in the, uh, the most famous Christmas cartoon uh, for a while, C Charlie Brown's Christmas uh, uh, little movie there. And so we're going to talk about Christmas this morning and what the Bible says about it. And, of course, you know that there's a lot of scuttlebutt about uh, Christmas and whether Christians ought to practice it, ought to observe it, ought to celebrate it, and what it is even. There's the war on Christmas in our culture that's been fighting about what it is. And so is Christmas a Christian thing? Is it not a Christian thing? Is it a pagan thing? And I, I don't want to deal with all of that this morning. Okay, we'll touch on it, but that's not the point of the lesson this morning. I really want to uh, get back to the scripture and what Christians who, who say Christmas is a Christian holiday and it's a biblical holiday, what the Bible says about it, if it says anything at all about it. And so there's a lot of confusion regarding Christmas. There's religious confusion about what, it, what it's supposed to be. Uh, is it pagan or not? So you have the conversation about uh, is the origins from pagan roots or does it come from the church? And uh, does that mean anything to us today since it's been so long since it, it first began? Uh, historical confusion. You know, where was the origin of the Christmas tree? Uh, was Santa Claus an, uh, an anagram for Satan, or is it St. Nicholas, you know, as the song says? And so we talk about the historical things, and there's confusion about that. Then, of course, it's one of the most practiced holidays by the world as well, and so that adds to the confusion because you have the, the worldly secular observance of the day, and so Christians who, who say this is a cr Christ day, it's Christ Mass, uh, now have the added confusion of, well, there's people who don't believe in Christ at all, who are very Christmassy. In fact, Charles Dickens said in his novel about a Christmas carol that if you're going to observe Christmas well, you should avoid the religious part of it. Uh, those who observe Christmas well do it without all the religious division. And so is that how we observe Christmas? Because it seemed like he was pretty happy in the Christmas carol. And, and so you have this, all this confusion about what it is and, and how to respond to it. And so the origins, where did it come from? Okay, it, the Catholicism. We know Christmas, the word, comes from the Mass of the Christ. And we, who doesn't know that, right? And the Mass, of course, is a Catholic thing in which they think that the cracker turns into Jesus' blood and they eat it for salvation. And that's wrong. Uh, but that's not what you do on Christmas. That's not what your family has done on Christmas, right? And so what about the Catholicism and the influence on that? Uh, Saint Nick and uh, the saints and the days that we observe or not we, but that are observed in Christianity, are Catholic days of obligation. And so why are there 12 days of Christmas? Because there's 12 days between one Catholic day of obligation and another Catholic day of obligation. And so it's just a mess. Uh, so what do we do about that? Does that mean we, we take it and redeem it for us? Or do we say, well, we're not going to have anything to do with it because the Catholics do it too. I'm not doing anything they do, right? I'll eat fish fillets, but I won't observe their days. Um, and the commercialism, you know, uh, the commercialism around it, where Charlie Brown, of course, mentioned in his, his uh, you know, monologue about the commercialism that it surrounds Christmas, and he got frustrated with this, and it's got to be more than all of this decoration, all of this frivolity. And, of course, Linus comes up in the cartoon and gives the answer in Luke chapter 2. Uh, and, and so what do we do with all that? Uh, the, the Catholicism, the commercialism, the, the, the confusion, that ought to be enough, actually for us to consider the day as something not something we should esteem, okay? Because doing that in itself would be a way of esteeming a day that people are confused about and that in various sundry ways does not represent biblical Christianity at all, okay? But again, that's not the real issue that we're going to talk about this morning. Because what's wrong, as Christians say, with taking the opportunity, since it is a conversation, since there is confusion about it, taking the opportunity to honor Christ with a day. I mean, let's honor a Christ with Christmas and honor Christ with New Year's and honor Christ with St. Patrick's Day and honor Christ with, you know, uh, you know all, the, all the days of the year. Why, why don't we do that? Okay. And so that's what we're dealing with this morning is, is what do we do with this day and what does the Bible say about it? Okay. Now, we need to consider, as I'm talking about Charlie Brown this morning and specifically uh, what Luke 2 says about Christmas, uh, we need to consider how we respond to the confusion of this day, the confusion of Christmas and the religious and spiritual confusion around it, uh, I think from a different perspective, and I'm going to try to present that to you here now, um, from the perspective of 
recent biblical movies that have been being released this year, this year of the Bible in movies. Okay, I don't know if you all see movies or not, but uh, Noah was released earlier in the year. Okay, you had Russell Crowe who portrayed Noah and the Ark and the Flood account. And do you remember the controversy around this movie, right? Because it was not made by a Christian. It was produced by unbelievers. And they were doing it because, of course, they saw that a lot of Christians want to see movies, and so they make this movie about Christianity. They see the, the money they can make from these sort of films, and so they make this, this, this film about Noah, right? And, of course, the controversy surrounded whether or not the movie was biblical, whether or not the movie stayed true to what the biblical account of Noah was, right? And so you had Christians on both sides of the fence. Some Christians said, well, at least they're making a movie about something in the Bible. Other Christians said, well, but it's not accurate. And it distorts the true message of Noah and what God was trying to communicate in Genesis 6 through 9. And so you had this confusion among the Christians on how do we handle this. And what I'm trying to say is that's a similar perspective that we need to have on Christmas as well. Okay? Do we take the opportunity of a day that has been confused and say, well, we need to do the best we can. At least they talk about Christ in the name. You know, and talk about Christ in some places. Or do we say, you know what, but it's not the way the Bible says we ought to talk about Christ. That, that's a different way of thinking about it. Because it's not about whether or not we reject Christ and reject his birth or reject uh, the account in the scripture. But it's the confusion that surrounds it, the, the misrepresentation. Okay, just recently uh, in December, the, the movie Exodus came out with Christian Bale. Well, Batman was in it, right? And so you have Exodus in the movie of Moses and Pharaoh. And the misrepresentations of that story from the Bible in that movie, it, it just takes away the best parts of what God was teaching and communicating in, in, the, in the book of Exodus. Uh, in that movie, Moses doesn't use a staff. He uses a sword, which I think communicates something very different okay, than, than what the Bible says. Uh, in, in the movie, uh, God's a child that appears to him. You know, and he's not speaking from the burning bush. It's a child that's constantly giving it. W what is that? You don't find that in Scripture at all. And so you get these things added to these movies that just are not what the Bible says, but they become part of the culture, part of the movie. And there's Christians on one side saying, well, at least they're talking about Moses again. They haven't done that since Cecil B. DeMille, you know, way back. At least they're talking about it again. And other Christians say, but they're doing it wrong. You know? yeah. So anybody old enough to remember that was Jesus Christ Superstar? <laughs> I know all of you. All right, it wasn't that old. I know that. that I, I didn't mean to slam you that way. Uh, but uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, when it came out, was controversial because a Jesus movie that presented Jesus as a hippie, right? And, and Christians were like, well, at least they're talking about Jesus. And the other one said, well, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. And so the controversy around the representation of Jesus. Who was it? Roma Downey and Mark Burnett or Barnett just recently made the Son of God epic mini TV series, right? Uh, representing Jesus and Noah in the beginning and the whole Bible, I think, in 10 series for television. And, of course, Mark, uh, Mark Burnett uh, created American Idol, and, and, and Roma Downey was uh, touched by an angel. And so th these, are, these are great pillars of American evangelical Christianity, and they're making this series the first time in 10 years about Jesus Christ in the Bible. And there's a controversy, because at least they're doing it, and then, but they're not doing it right. And, and so what side do we need to take on these issues? And, again, I'm not talking about movies this morning. I use that as an example, an illustration of how we handle Christmas, because I see it as the same. Because people are talking about Christmas, and there's confusion about it. There's people who are looking at it, not understanding what it really is, or what it really isn't, from both sides of the fence. And there are Christians who say, well, at least it's out there. At least we can use it as an opportunity, as a marketing tool. Some Christians even say that that's why it was originally invented by the, the Christians. By Christians, they mean Catholic Christians, okay? In order to bring people into Christianity, right? But is that our approach to things? Or do we say we need to represent the Bible accurately, clearly? What does the Bible actually teach? Well, at least they're preaching Jesus as they produce the Gospel of John movie. And how, it's, it's the most widespread you know, Christian movie, or if not movie, around the globe, that, the John movie, right, the Gospel of John. But how many people understand that in the Gospel of John, in your Bible, Jesus is ministering to Israel? And he has not yet revealed the mystery of the gospel, the excellent information we were talking about at 10 o'clock this morning. That's not in the Gospel of John. What you find there is a Messiah come to Israel doing miracles, promising a kingdom. You don't find there that I did it all for you by death on the cross. Christ doesn't even die until the end of the book of John. You see? And so at least there's the gospel out there of John. That's one of 66. They need to be preaching th the cross, don't they? Remember Mel Gibson in the Passion movie? Before the most recent movie about the Son of God by... 
American Idol and, and Touched by an Angel, uh, Mel Gibson, 10 years ago, created the Passion movie. The controversy around the Passion movie, right? Christians were on board with it because this is the, the first big sp expenditure movie that was created to witness to people about Jesus Christ, right? And of course it was talking about Jesus' earthly ministry. But anybody see what was missing from the movie? And that was the controversy? The resurrection. <laughs> Which Paul says, without the resurrection, you're yet in your sins. And so, yeah, Jesus Christ, even though it wasn't from the Bible, it was from a Catholic nun who had mystic experiences, but it, Jesus Christ was there, but he didn't resurrect. And it was more about his suffering than it was for his sacrifice for you. You see, the confusion here. How do we respond to this? Do we just let it go? Do we ignore it? Or do we go to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say we need to be ministering and how we need to be communicating? And that's the side we need to take. And so, again, I, I don't want to deal with the pagan origins or, or, or those things this morning. As so many people think that those who don't observe Christmas are only upset at Chris, Christians who do it because it's pagan. Well, I, I know there's pagan origins. Even the unbelievers. I got an article over here. At, it's by an unbelieving magazine, uh, a nationally syndicated magazine. And, and they, they, cl they understand that it's pagan origins. Everyone knows this. And Christians who deny this are just living in fantasy land. If there's pagan, pagan origins that Catholic Christians took as part of their own, and they've changed the meaning of it. Fine. That's how it is. But how do we respond to Christmas, forgetting the pagan origins of where it came from? Because we're 2,000 years removed. We're thousands of years removed from the origins. It's been going on for a while, okay? And as Kirk Cameron made known in his recent uh, movie endeavor, Saving Christmas, right, is that even though it was originally pagan, it's not anymore because we've been doing it for centuries, and there's some truth to that. Uh, I don't think people go home. I don't think you go home and worship an evergreen tree, do you? Uh, that's not what I did growing up. I had Christmas trees growing up. I didn't worship the evergreen tree, you know, the god of uh, Odin, you know. But that's not the concern this morning, okay? The concern I'm talking about this morning is how we approach Christmas and whether or not it's me uh, representing the Bible accurately, or is it a misrepresentation, okay? So it has nothing to do with the origins of it, nothing to do with the Catholicism of it this morning, even though we can talk about those issues, it's what does the Bible say about Christmas? Okay, and that's why I titled it Charlie Brown Christmas, because of all the, the little stories and movies and frosty and legends that, that circulate around Christmas, adding to the confusion, Charlie Brown and his little cartoon there by Charles Schultz, a good Church of God Anderson, uh, Indiana uh, believer, he, he, he showed the commercialism with humor and everything and Charlie Brown, and he just wants to know what Christmas is all about. And Linus dims the lights. He goes up on the stage. You've seen the movie, right? And then he, he starts reading Luke chapter 2. You know, and to you who was born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And he reads Luke chapter 2. He walks up the stage and says, that's what Christmas is all about. It's about the birth of Jesus Christ, right? And Linus, representing the evangelical Christian, uh, says Luke 2 is what it's about. Luke 2. That's what I want to explore this morning. And what does Luke 2 say? And is it just something we're throwing out there because at least it's something or is it really what the Bible would have us communicate to a world that's lost and dying and needs to know Jesus Christ as their Savior? You see, we need to evaluate that as the workman. I'm talking here to the workman. I'm not talking here to the world who needs to hear Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? But do we need to present it any old way we can? Or present it the right way, the clear way? What does the Bible say about this? Okay. So let's look at Luke chapter 1. Linus said Luke 2 is the reason for the season. And many Christians say it's to celebrate the birth of Christ. That's what they say. And again, we can talk about whether or not, uh, you know, this was something that was going on before Jesus Christ, which it was. But let's deal with the issue that Christians want to make it, which is that it's the birth of Jesus Christ. We're celebrating our Lord's birth. Surely that is something to respect and to honor. We're in Luke chapter 1. Before we get to Luke 2, we need to get some context. You say, context? You know, Dad didn't spend that much time reading Luke uh, on Christmas Day. <laughs> That's why we're Bible students, you see. That's what is, is fitting of workmen, that we just don't pull little snippets out of the Bible and throw them out there because maybe it'll work. We understand the context and what God's purpose is. And so before Luke 2, of course, is Luke chapter 1. And Luke is writing, of course, this account of what he calls the gospel of Jesus Christ, or, or he doesn't call it the gospel of Jesus Christ, but rather the, the account, the history of the things that happened regarding Jesus Christ. And he's writing it to this gentleman named Theophilus. People debate about who this guy is. He could have been a high priest. He could have been a, a fellow Jew or somebody that he was communicating the story of who Jesus Christ was, what he did, uh, 
all the way to his, his death and resurrection and through that to the Acts of the Apostles. Luke wrote the book of Acts as well. So Luke is telling the whole story. He's not stopping at the death, the death and resurrection as Matthew and Mark do and, and John. He's going beyond that in the book of Acts and explaining what happened after that. And the Holy Ghost came down. And then there were 12 apostles. Then there was the apostle, the Gentiles, and Paul. And Luke traveled with Paul around, ministering the gospel, the grace of God. So Luke begins this whole story in Luke chapter 1 with a guy named Zacharias. Okay, this is where he begins that. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughter of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God. We talked this morning about uh, being justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Romans 3.24. Okay? But we're in Luke 1, verse uh, 6 right now. We're not in Romans chapter 3, verse 24. And we know in Luke chapter 1, in the context of Zechariah and Elizabeth, um, John the Baptist wasn't born yet. Jesus wasn't born yet. Paul was still Saul. And he was not saved by God's grace yet. The mystery had not yet been revealed. In Luke 1, verse 6, it says, They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. These people were living under the law. Zechariah was a priest in the temple, doing ministry in Israel's temple. And he was counted righteous because by his faith he did the works that God required. That's what the law taught. By faith, you do what God says. And God said then to go to the temple, offer your sacrifices, do the commandments. And Elizabeth and Zechariah were doing that, and thus they are called here righteous, walking in all the commandments. So hopefully, you don't, again, you don't hear about this stuff in the Christmas story. Linus didn't read Luke chapter 1. He read Luke chapter 2. It sounded a lot better. But this is the context of Jesus' birth. Paul says that Jesus was born, made of a woman, under the law. In Luke chapter 1, verse 7, they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. By the way, I need to make a comment here about uh, uh, Zacharias and what he was doing uh, as a priest in verse 5 of the course of Abiah. You see that phrase there, of the course of Abiah? You say, well, that doesn't mean much to me. But if you knew the law, if you understood 1st, 2nd Chronicles and read Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you'd understand that there were uh, priests, at least 24 different priests over the course of a year that spent two-week intervals ministering in the temple doing certain things, offering incense or whatnot. Okay, so every two weeks they switched. They had different courses of, of the priests of the Levites. Okay, and that is how you can determine in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, when Zechariah is doing this ministry in the temple. Because it tells you of the course of Abiah. You say, so what? What do I care when Zechariah was in the temple? Well, this is why, in case you're wondering, when Jesus was actually born. You can calculate from the course of Abiah to the birth of his son, John the Baptist, to the conception of Jesus in Luke chapter 2. Okay? You can know when Jesus was born from the Bible. But you wouldn't know that studying church history and tradition because there is no evidence in church history and tradition of when Jesus was born. And the closest we get is rumors and uh, church decisions that we're just going to make it December 25th. But again, that's not the issue with Christmas. But just letting you know, when you do Bible study, I've got pages, if you're interested, that you can calculate the course of Abiah and when Jesus was born. Okay? And it's not this week. It was 2,000 years ago, probably in the fall. But meanwhile, Luke chapter 1, in verse 9, it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, <coughs> standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And he said, Fear not, Zechariah, thy prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son that shall call his name John. Before Jesus was born, in Luke chapter 2, was John the Baptist. Okay? That, that proves to you Linus was a Baptist, right? Well, no. Uh, uh, he was uh, uh, Luke chapter 1, John the Baptist was a prophet prophesied to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. We'll cover that here in a little bit here. But we see in Luke chapter 1, verse 14, that thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. At John's birth, many shall rejoice. Now, everyone's familiar with rejoicing at the birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas, right? What about rejoicing at John the Baptist's birth? Why would we do that? Why on earth would we rejoice at John the Baptist's birth? Which, is, by the way, is, is one of the few births in the Bible it says to rejoice at. But he says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, 
and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He says, John the Baptist, the angel says, John the Baptist is the fulfillment of what Malachi said would happen to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Turn in your Bible, keep your hand on Luke chapter 1. We're going to come back there. Turn left to Malachi. If you just keep turning left, you'll get there. It's before Matthew. Malachi chapter 3 and 4. The book of Malachi, which we've covered verse by verse uh, before on Tuesdays, details the prophecies that predicted John the Baptist's birth and him being the, pre pre the preparer, the predecessor of Jesus Christ, Israel, and the events that would happen around John's ministry and Jesus' ministry. So Malachi 3 and 4 are very important chapters. Malachi 3 verse 1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. So you see there's a messenger that God's going to send, the messenger that would come before the Lord. That's John the Baptist. The angel tells Zechariah he's going to have a son named John. Look at verse 2 in Malachi 3. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He shall sit as refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Anybody purge gold and silver at home for fun? No. Apparently I'm going to have a trouble with application here. But uh, when you purge gold and silver, it's with fire, you see. You burn it. You, you heat it up to such a degree that the impurities burn up and fall away. Okay, that's how you refine and purify, with fire. Okay, that's why Santa Claus comes down the chimney. <laughs> right? No? This is what Christians do, though, with the traditions. They just make things up. But I don't want to go there. I told you I wasn't going to deal with that this morning. In Malachi 3, verse 2 and 3, you see John the Baptist, when he comes, it's coming at a time when God's going to purify the nation, the priest and the whole nation. is going to purify, get rid of the wicked, and he's going to maintain the righteous. A time of judgment, a discernment, separation. Look at Malachi chapter 4. It says, Behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven. Right? Cooking Christmas turkey, you know. No. Burn as an oven in judgment over the nation of Israel. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And so you see in Malachi 4 again, this prophecy of judgment. And you say, where's John the Baptist in all this? Well, you look down in verse... Uh, Five, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That's John the Baptist. That's what the angel said in Luke 1 was John the Baptist's job. He fulfills Malachi 4. Before the day that burns like an oven, John the Baptist comes to warn, to prepare, to get them ready, okay, for the Lord's return in judgment, okay. So let's go back to Luke chapter 1. And we're seeing already the context of Luke and Matthew and Mark and Luke goes back to the prophets and goes back to Israel and what they were expecting would happen because God told them it would happen. And John the Baptist is one sign of the times for Israel that the end is coming, that the judgment is coming, that their king is going to come and conquer. Okay. And Luke chapter 1, down in verse 18. Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? <clears throat> I'm a man, and I'm an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. <clears throat> the angel goes on to explain, Well, I'm Gabriel, and I have uh, God sent me to show you these things. He he eventually makes him mute, so he can't say anything because he doesn't believe the angel the first time. Let's start on to verse 24. I'm going to skip some of these. It came to pass in verse 23 that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house, and after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived. So this is the calculation if you're doing it. Uh, when Zechariah worked in the temple, after he was done with his job, him and his wife got pregnant, and going on from there. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach from men. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now there's someone more familiar to the Christmas story, Mary, right? Look how Mary is described in verse 28. Look as we study Mary here, the character of this woman and who she is and what she knows. 
Because I know we sing, Mary, did you know, about her not knowing who this son was. But you know, Mary knew a lot of things. She knew a lot of things about what God had promised and what God had prophesied. And because of her obedience to God, because of what she knew, she says the things she does. And she, she knew who her son was going to be because the angel told her. What she didn't know, which is the same thing the 12 apostles didn't know, was the mystery of the gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the mystery, the preaching of the cross. She didn't know how the killing of her baby would be a good thing. That's how she didn't know. Okay? But she knew exactly what God had promised to Israel and what a blessing it is for her to be the vehicle through which this thing would be fulfilled. Okay? The mother of the Savior. But we're in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. The angel came unto Mary, this virgin, and said unto her, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So we have here the Hail Mary. You didn't think you were a Catholic, did you? It's a, that's where they get the Hail Mary, right there in Luke chapter 1. Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And so the Roman Catholics uh, will tell you to do Hail Mary prayers in order to, to, to atone for your sins, in order to pay for some of your sins. So that you've heard it before, the priest says, say five Hail Marys, you know, ten Our Fathers, that sort of thing. So you say these prayers do works to pay for your sins. The Hail Mary prayer in Catholicism is Hail Mary, full of grace, our Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. That's Luke chapter 1. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Roman Catholics pray to Mary for her to pray to God to forgive them of their sins. Okay, because she's blessed among women. Because of Luke chapter 1. There's a reason why the Christmas story, Linus reads, is in Luke chapter 2. Okay, and that's because Christmas, which again originated from paganism originally, but was taken over by the church, which are Catholics in the past, okay, they honor and revere Mary. And Luke chapter 2 reveres Mary. Mary's the key person, Luke chapter 1 and 2. Mary's the one that does, does the most speaking. Jesus Christ doesn't say a word in Luke 1 and 2. Jesus Christ doesn't do anything in Luke chapter 1 and 2. He just comes down to birth canal. That's all he does. But Mary, she's chosen of the angels. She's blessed art thou among women. She says things about God fulfilling prophecies and promises through her and her husband. Okay? So she's the character in Luke chapter 1 and 2. So again, as we're studying the Bible and what Luke 1 and Luke 2 is representing here, we're seeing this is very different than what you know as Christmas, what I'm familiar with in tradition about Christmas. It's not Christmas, you see. And yet Christians repeatedly say the Christmas stories in Luke chapter 2 when they know full well that that's not what people mean when they say Christmas. Even when they, meet, they are well-intentioned to say we need to honor Christ and celebrate his birth, they know they're not doing it the way the Bible says. In the same way when Russell Crowe and he's doing the ark and he, they make him a murderer and they have giant rock aliens in the movie. That's not what Genesis 6 through 9 says happened with the flood. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's out there, I guess, but it's not accurate. It's not what the Bible says, you see. So we're celebrating Jesus and, and Holy Mary, right? Well, yeah, I can find verses in the Bible that talk about that, but that's not what it intended to do. It, it, he wasn't presenting Mary here as a mediator, as the Catholic teach. But let's move on here in Luke chapter 2, or Luke chapter 1, rather. Luke chapter 1, we're at the Hail Mary, that thou art highly favored. By the way, anybody know where the Hail Mary Pass originated from? Yeah, yes, sir. Roger Staubach, yeah. Back, back versus the Vikings, playoffs, right? Throws this, this unfathomable pass, and it happens only by divine intervention. He, and he's a Roman Catholic, Roger Staubach. And so when asked about it later, he said, I said a Hail Mary, and I just threw the ball. People have been saying it ever since. Do the Hail Mary Pass. Why? Because it ain't going to happen unless God does something, right? <laughs> And even then, it probably won't happen, because we know God doesn't answer your prayers, right? But, you know, it's a Hail Mary. We'll do five of them if we have to. But, uh, yeah, that, it's just an interesting little tidbit there. It's, it's Roman Catholic. But how many people would know that? You know, you're playing football, everyone is the Hail Mary Pass. Just go along. I'll just keep it up there. But it came from Roman Catholics. <laughs> Meanwhile, a lot of things come from Catholicism that, you, that we're not aware of. Um, and we, we deal with it every day. You know, the folks who say, well, you, you say you shouldn't observe Christmas because it's pagan. Well, that's not the biggest reason why I say that. But I know there's lots of things pagan in our culture. The days of our week are pagan, right? And I put those on my calendar, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're all named after pagan gods. Who, who doesn't know what days of the week are, right? That's not an evil thing as we use them. 
But that's not the point we're dealing with this morning, whether or not Christmas is biblically accurate. Let's just deal with that. Not about all the other stuff that confuses people. Is it biblically accurate? Because if people are going to be reading Luke 2 this Christmas around you, you who know the Bible ought to at least say, well, let's represent the Bible accurately. Let's not gloss over what the Bible is saying in Luke 2, Luke chapter 1. Because we're opening the Bible, we're reading the Christmas story. What is it saying? Okay, nobody thinks about that when they read it. It becomes a tradition. They read into it what isn't there. Okay, we need to do better as Christians than that. Okay? But meanwhile, we're Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 in, in verse uh, or 28, Hail Mary, 29. When she saw, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. By the way, how would Mary find favor with God? How would God find favor with Mary? Would it be because Mary is just, you know, she's a sinner, and God looks at her and says, you know what, you're just the worst little girl. She's a virgin. She knows what God's will is. She's obedient to God's law, you see. She's found favor with God. That helped. Now, I know that we're all sinners. The Roman Catholics don't know that. They think Mary was sinless. They think that's how she found favor with God. But again, this is not something people consider when they're reading Luke chapter 1 and 2, the confusion around this. But in Luke chapter 1, in verse uh, 20, 29, she found favor with God because of her obedience. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And so you see here what the angel says. And what does he promise? Is he talking here about building up the church and preaching the cross to all those who need God's grace for salvation? He's not. He's talking about your son is going to be a king. That's good news. That's great news. If an angel appeared to you when you had a baby and said, your son's going to be the president. Yeah. Especially if God prophesied that that would happen. Right? He's going to be the king. He's going to sit on the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Wow! Forget the elections. I'll be king forever. Right? That's what Jesus is going to be for Israel. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now this is important language to understand because this is not the first time it's been mentioned that the, throne, the, the person who sits on the throne of David will reign forever. In fact, this goes way back to the Old Testament. If we turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, let's see, 2 Samuel... There's no Christmas story in 2 Samuel. Well, it's part of it, you see. It's part of what's going on in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2 is this thing called the Davidic covenant, the promise given to David. That's why Matthew chapter 1 starts out, the, the words of Matthew 1, 1 says, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And that's why in Luke chapter 2, the angel said, is born unto you this day in the city of David. That wasn't just a historical trivia they were throwing in there. It's important that Jesus was born in the city of David. It not only fulfilled prophecy, but it was a promise God gave David. And that promise is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay. So in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see in verse 12, it says, When thy days be fulfilled. Here's God speaking through Jonathan to David, or through Nathan to David. And it says in 2 Samuel 7 verse 12, When your days are done, when you die... Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, is what he says. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now this is a significant promise to David. Because before David, there were kings that did not last forever. Saul, namely. Okay? Saul was anointed and chosen of God to be king of Israel, and God cut him down when he disobeyed God's commands. But to David, even though David disobeyed God, God gave a promise to him, a promise, an unconditional promise. He said, David, I'm going to make your throne last forever through your seed. Through a person that comes from your line, your family, I will give this throne and it'll be established forever. And this is the beginning of the, the line of David being the king in the kingdom of Israel. Which is why Luke chapter 1 is talking about this. And the angel says to Mary that your son 
will sit on the throne of his father David and reign over the, the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. It's a fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7. You see why Mary is so happy about this a little bit later. Okay? She knows what's going on. She is knowledgeable about 2 Samuel 7. She's not ignorant of that. Okay? She's not just going about her days hoping that we had another holiday you know, to celebrate. She, she's, she knows the Bible. She knows the scripture. And she realizes that prophecy is being fulfilled. Luke chapter 1, verse 34, Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She's a virgin after all. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So it's not just you're going to have a son. It's going to, you're going to have a son of God. That's who he's going to be. Because he's not going to have an earthly father. It's the Holy Ghost that's going to help you with this conception here. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her. And so there's the calculation again after doing it. So you have six months from Elizabeth. You can calculate the course of Abiah. You can tell when Jesus was born. And it says, this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen. Praise God to that. Right? God will fulfill what he says will happen. And when God promises unto you a virgin, a virgin will, will conceive, unto you a child is born, and tells you that that child will be born in Bethlehem, as, as Micah says, and then the angel comes to Mary and says, this, you're, this is it, it's time. The prophecies are going to be fulfilled, and it's going to be fulfilled through you. And she goes, well, how? They go, God's going to do it. Isn't that just like God? Everywhere in the scripture, when God says something's going to happen, he always seems like he's got to do it himself. He's just selfish that way, apparently. God just does it himself. He did it with Sarah. He did it with Rebecca. He did it with Israel. When he delivered Israel out of Egypt, it wasn't Christian Baal. It wasn't nature that made those plagues happen, as the movie suggests. It was God that sent those plagues. It was God that parted the waters, not tornadoes and winds. It was God that did it. Nothing is impossible with God. And that's the point of those plagues back there. That's the point of parting the waters back there. And in the Psalms, when it refers back to the wonders that God did, it's referring to the wonders of Exodus. You say, well, at least it's a movie about the Bible. But they took God out of it, you see. And now it's just a natural coincidence that just happened to start a new religion. Well, that's not biblical. That's not right. And so you know, that sense of fervor that we have about getting it right should be applied to Christmas as well. We need to get it right, right? We're going to celebrate Jesus' birth, and who wouldn't want to celebrate Jesus? Let's at least get it right. But I, I contend that you can't celebrate Christmas and get it right. It, it, it won't fly. It won't work. Charles Dickens couldn't, right? But meanwhile, we see here in Luke chapter 1, Mary is given this promise that she's going to be the, the fulfiller of these things, at least her son is. And we see in verse 39, uh, you know, let's skip a few things here. She travels to visit her, her cousin. Let's drop down to verse 48. Uh, 45, rather. Elizabeth says, Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Elizabeth is blessing Mary. Blessed art thou among women, right? Because she believed what God told her through the angel, that she would have a son uh, that would sit on the throne of David. Verse 46, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. God is not a distant God to Mary. God is not a God that she doesn't know or doesn't know what he's doing. God is Mary's Savior. Okay, She knew that from reading the scripture, knew that from reading Israel's law. And it says in verse 48, He hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. So Mary goes into this praise of God for what he's going to do through her. But I want to show you here a few examples of what Mary says here that shows proof that she's more knowledgeable than the songs would su suggest. Okay? She knows what God is doing and its importance for Israel. Uh, turn to Psalm 103. We're going to be in the Psalms here a little bit. Because as Mary is praising God, her example of praise towards God is in the Psalms. When David wrote a lot of these things, praising God for keeping his promises, or that he would keep his promises. Psalm 103, verse 17. See what it says here. It says, The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him 
and his righteousness unto his children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. God is merciful to those that fear him, that keep his commandments, that are in his covenant. Flip back to Luke chapter 1, in verse 49 and 50, Mary says, This mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. What is she saying? She's saying, I'm that one. I'm the one that's been keeping the commandments. I'm the one that's been fearing God. He's my Savior. I praise him. And because of that, God has mercy on me. God is, is doing this work through me. Right? And so we see here God responding according to a covenant with Mary. Uh, according to her obedience in that covenant. Look at verse 51 of Luke chapter 1. It says, He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their heart hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Mary, because she's so used to singing the Psalms in her dispensation under the law, that she just starts praising God by quoting these things. If you look at Psalm chapter 89, in verse 2, she says, look at the strength of his arm. And that phrase is all over the Old Testament. It has to do with God's ability to do something. If something's out of your reach and you can't reach it with your arm, you can't do it. You can't grab it. You can't, you can't accomplish it. But over and over again in the Old Testament, it says God's arm is strong. God's arm is long. He is able to do what he says. And Psalm 89 talks about God's covenant with David, which is what the angel is, is, is explaining to Mary, and what Mary is praising God for. In Psalm 89, verse 2, it says, I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. That's what the angel told Mary would happen through her. In Psalm 89, verse 10, it says uh, about God, is, or verse 8 says, O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? Verse 10, Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. That's what Mary said. Praise the Lord that cast down the mighty and brings up the humble, and his arm is strong. He remembers his covenant. Okay, that's, it's a good praise to praise when an angel comes to fulfill those things. Psalm 89, down in verse uh, 13, it says, Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Down in verse 20, it says, I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of the wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face. God's going to beat people down. For David's sake. And that's what Mary's praising God for. That she re he remembers. Down in verse 28. Psalm 89, 28. says, My mercy will I keep for him forever. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. God will not with David forget his covenant. It's not that when David sinned and committed adultery and murder. Like God said, that's it David. You had your chance. I'm done with you. Now with Israel under the law. That's how God responded. But to David, remember he made a promise. A promise that I will give you mercy and that your seed will be established forever. There's no condition there. I'm going to do it. So Psalm 89 says God's faithful to do this. Even when David fails and Israel fails and Israel goes into captivity for 70 years and they come back and they're servants to the Romans when Mary is living in Luke chapter 1, that God remembers the mercy he promised to David and will fulfill what he said would happen and bring a king through David's line. That's what Mary knows. That's what she's praising God for, singing these psalms. Because I knew it would happen. After hundreds of years, I knew God would do it. Right? That's what Mary's praising God over. So Psalm 89, verse 28. His covenant will stand fast. His seed will endure forever. His throne is the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, I will visit their transgressions with the rod. Nevertheless, verse 33, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor, uh, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. You see the importance of what's going on in Luke chapter 1? Luke is explaining these things, not coincidentally. He's explaining them because the Old Testament talks about a covenant with David that God will keep, even if Israel disobeys his commandments. And so when the angel appears to Israel after hundreds of years of disobedience and says to Mary, the king's coming through you. Wow, David was right after all. The Psalms were right after all. The prophets were right after all. God is faithful. Praise be to God that he remembers his covenant and is merciful. And he has a strong arm. Okay, look at Luke chapter 1 then. Again, Luke chapter 1. 
in verse 53. Mary here is praising God, says, He hath filled the hungry with good things. Mary talks a lot, doesn't she? He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. We've already covered that in Psalm 89. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. So God remembers his mercy as he spake to our fathers. Mary knows the promises God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knows, she knows the promises God made to David. She knows about these things, and she's praising God that are now coming to pass. And through her. Wow. What an amazing honor. <clears throat> How blessed she must feel. And so it says in verse 56, Mary abode with Elizabeth about three months and returned to her house. So, so far we've seen that in context of Jesus' birth and the Christmas story in Luke 2 is the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. Okay, is, is David's covenant, is the coming kingdom, is God remembering uh, that he made a covenant and a contract with that nation and is going to destroy their enemies in order for them to be the nation above the nations. Okay, now we have to ask ourselves, before we get into Luke chapter 2, whether or not this is what we need to be presenting to a world that already thinks we're trying to undermine their authority. Right? The world looks at Christians today and they say, well, those Christians, they're a bunch of rebels. They're a bunch of people who are just uh, opposing our way, which Christians would be against the course of this world. But Christians who think that they're establishing a kingdom today don't have God's help. Okay, that, that's something we need to consider. The Christians who think that they're establishing the kingdom God promised to Israel on the earth today, not in the future, but today, do not have God's help. Because God today is working to build a church and presenting grace and peace to the world through the gospel of Christ. God will not help the church physically through force establish a kingdom on earth. We are his ambassadors, which is a different position than being the conqueror of this earth. Okay. But in Luke chapter 1, none of that was known. In Luke chapter 1, we have a nation that God made and people that God promised to. And he tells Luke, the angel tells Luke, or tells Mary rather, that it's going to come to pass. God is sending the king. Remember John the Baptist? He comes before the king in order to prepare the way, prepare the nation so they can be purified with fire. This is the context of Luke chapter 1. All right? So we're in Luke chapter 1. Drop down to verse 67. <coughs> Luke 167. John the Baptist is born, and after he's born, a miracle happens because his father can now speak. And not only does he speak, but he's filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesies in Luke 167. Verse 68 says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Mary already knew that. Zechariah couldn't say it for months, but now he can. He hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. <coughs> so I heard the other day, uh, some Christian was talking about uh, the real reason for the season and, and Christmas and how uh, the point of Christmas is to make known salvation here uh, to the world. In Luke 1, 69, he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us. And who would disagree with this? Don't we want to save, get the gospel of salvation to people? Shouldn't we want to do that? So amen, we should preach salvation. Winter, summer, spring, and fall, right? All year we should preach salvation to people. And yet, is Luke 1, 69 the salvation we're supposed to be preaching? And so we need to ask ourselves this, because in Luke 1, 69, Jesus Christ isn't born yet, let alone had not died yet. The preaching of the cross is at no Luke 1, 69. Sure, let's preach salvation, but is Luke 1, 69 and, 60 and 70 the salvation we preach? <clears throat> Luke 1, 70 says, As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Now, we already covered it at 10 o'clock, but just as a review, the gospel we preach was a mystery kept secret since the world began. In Luke 1, 70, the salvation Zechariah is speaking about, according to the Holy Ghost, is something the prophets spoke about and what was under the law and that was given to the, the fathers of Israel. And look what verse 71 says. This is what it is. The salvation he's talking about is that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. That's the salvation he's talking about. He's talking about a nation that is under bondage to a, a heathen empire, the Romans, and that have not had a place of prominence in the world since David, and the nation fell after that. And the salvation Zechariah is, is saying will happen now through this, this boy is salvation from our enemies. We'll be delivered from captivity. It will again become the nation that God promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Okay, well, the kingdom will come, is what he's saying. All them that hate us. Don't Christians want that today? And it's, it's a good intention. Don't we want to be delivered from all them that hate us? 
it seems more and more in our country, there's people that hate us or hate things about the Bible or Jesus Christ. And don't we just want to be rid of that? We want not to be hated. We want not to have to fight that fight. And what if Christ could just solve that for us? Or what if we can say, declare the kingdom is here? The kingdom's here now, and so we're going to be saved from all our enemies. You will be disappointed today. Okay? It's not that God's unfaithful. It's that God's not doing that today. You see? You can't take any verse from the Bible and say that's what God's doing now because he did it before. No, because God changes what he does. That, that's what, what it means to study the Bible dispensationally or to rightly divide the scriptures to make sure the scripture is in its context because if you take it out of context, it causes confusion and it causes disappointment and it causes you not to know what God is doing, your ignorance of God's will. And so here, God's talking about establishing a kingdom and delivering them from their enemies. Today, God has sent ambassadors, you and I, of his church to a world that has rejected him already. And it's not our purpose to conquer the world, but to preach to the world reconciliation with God through the preaching of the cross. But Luke chapter 1, verse 70 says, To perform the mercy promised to our fathers to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham. Is that part of your Christmas story? You know the true meaning of Christmas, kids? Well, let's start with Abraham. Let's then go to Isaac, then Jacob, and then God gave the law to Moses, and he made prophecies about David. Nobody talks about that stuff at Christmas. It's the manger. It's Mary on a donkey and the three wise men. And well, what about Luke 170, the salvation that Zacharias is talking about, according to the covenant that God made with the fathers of Israel? Well, yeah. You see what I'm talking about when I say that it misrepresents what the Bible is speaking about? We can't just take verses from the Bible, make bookmarks with them, and think this is going to get people saved. Okay? We need to preach the gospel clearly, or else we're just adding to the confusion. And so in Luke chapter 1, and verse 74, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Wish that were so. I want to do that. I want to serve God in righteousness and holiness the rest of my life without having to worry about laws going against my beliefs, without having to worry about atheists on TV blaspheming God and speaking against what I do. I want that. Who doesn't want God's kingdom? But if now is not the time, we're disobedient to try to bring, make it the time, you see. We're, we're not doing our responsibility if God's not doing it today. And we're not living in the time of Luke chapter 1. But here in Luke 2, the Christmas story, this is what, the so-called Christmas story, this is what the, the time is described as. Verse 75, it says, In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. This is interesting here because Zechariah prophesies about salvation of Israel from their enemies in their lifetime. Okay? In the lifetime. This is not some sort of spiritual, well, God reigns in your heart. As, by the way, the, the, that's what the Catholics teach. The Catholics are amillennialists, which mean that they believe all the prophecies about God's kingdom are purely spiritual, not physical, will never be fulfilled literally in the planet, but spiritually in the hearts of men. Okay? Now, if you take your Bible literally, you think, well, sometime in the future, God's going to set up his kingdom on the earth. Because it's not happening now. But if you think everything's spiritual in the Bible, you'll read this in Luke 1, 75, and say, oh, this just means that you'll have Christ in your heart and God in your life. And we'll, we'll not talk about the, the real atrocities in the world that are against you and against God. But Luke 1, 75, Zechariah says, all the days of our life, this is the time that salvation is going to come. We'll be delivered from the Romans, and in our lifetime, we'll have the kingdom here. And what does John the Baptist preach? The gospel of the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. What does Jesus Christ preach in Mark 1, 14? The gospel of the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's close. Now, that was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> the kingdom of God was at hand? Deliverance from our enemies? All those that hate us? Living in righteousness and holiness and peace all the days of our life? I haven't seen that in my life. Have you seen it in your life? I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something. That's the difference between taking the Bible literally and then spiritualizing all the Bible. You see? So we're, we're going to care about what the Bible says to whom it says it. We need to realize Luke 1 is talking about a very different time than what we're living in right now. In verse 76, it says, uh, Thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give the knowledge of salvation unto his people. Who were God's people? Israel. By the remission of their sins. How were their sins remitted? Anybody know Matthew 1, Matthew 3? Be water baptized for the remission of sins? No, they weren't preaching that. 
every time water baptism is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's for the remission of sins. But we know it's not for the remission of our sins today because what's offered for our forgiveness of sins? The blood of Jesus Christ, you see. So the gospel that they were preaching, and this is the, the, the important part, the gospel they were preaching is a different gospel than what we preach. Okay? The gospel they were preaching was good news, fulfill their prophecy, to bring a king, for, have their sins remitted of salvation from their enemies. Great news. It was a gospel of a kingdom. It wasn't the gospel of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, which for some people is a contradiction. How can his death on the cross be good news? Right? Well, that's, that's the mystery of Christ. That's the gospel, is that his death on the cross uh, saves humanity by his resurrection. Right? And so in Luke chapter 1, they did not know the gospel that you and I preach. Uh, keep your hand on Luke chapter 1 and turn to Luke 18. And you'll see in Luke 18, 34, we've covered these verses a multitude of times before. Luke 18, 31 through 33. Now, Luke 1 is before Jesus is born, before the Christmas story, right? But in Luke 18, 31 through 34, we have Jesus after he is born, and he's able to speak here, which is always better to ha ask Jesus what his thoughts are than to see him laying there in a manger as a baby, not able to talk. But Luke 18, verse 31, he took unto him the twelve, his twelve apostles, and said unto him, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. They shall scourge him, put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Now, if there's anything in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that is the closest to the gospel you and I preach, it's that right there, Luke 18, 33. I mean, Christ dying and raising from the dead for your sins, that's exactly where Paul starts his gospel. You thought there were only four gospels in the Bible, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Actually, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then there's Paul's in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, this is the gospel that I preached unto you, that Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead of the third day. Paul begins his gospel where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John end, you see. But Luke 18, 33, this is the closest you get to what Paul says is the gospel he preached for your salvation. And in verse 34, look at the disciples that were around him. Not the unbelievers, the disciples, those who were faithfully following him as the king into the kingdom. They did not understand. They understood none of these things. The saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. They did not understand when Jesus told him, I need to die and resurrect. They didn't get it. What they did get was the kingdom. What they did understand was the king. What they did understand was the Davidic covenant. They understood the prophecies and the Psalms. They did not understand his death and resurrection. Okay. You say, we've heard that before. We've learned right division. We know that they didn't understand the cross. It was revealed to Paul later. But now let's go back to Luke 2, everyone, before we open our presents and read the Christmas story. Okay. Luke 2 does not have the gospel of your salvation in it. Have I, have I properly walked you to that place? Because if I would have said that at the beginning of the lesson, you'd be like, oh, no, Jesus Christ is in Luke 2, right? But have I walked through the place where understanding that Luke 2 does not contain the gospel that saves you today? And so when you go back and read that, you might as well read Deuteronomy 32 or Psalm 15. You say, what's the point of those chapters? Well, you've got to read and find out. But they're just as significant as Luke 2. Because Luke 2 does not contain the gospel of your salvation. But Christmas is the greatest Christian holiday. Right? It's what the world needs to hear is the message of Christmas. Okay, where's the message of Christmas, Charlie Brown? Linus says Luke chapter 2. Luke 2 does not contain the gospel that saves the world today. Right? It's a misrepresentation of what God is doing today. Let's get it right. Let's, you sit around with your family who, who observe Christmas. They got the presents. You're eating your turkey, eating your, your food with your family. You know, I don't lose sleep that people celebrate Christmas. I really don't. I love family. I like to eat food. Isn't that what Christmas is about? <laughs> Linus says it's Luke 2. I think it's about food and family. <laughs> right? But, you know, that stuff, so you're sitting there doing that, people are saying Jesus is the reason for the season? Yeah, you know what? Jesus is a good reason for every season. Let's read about the gospel of Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 15. They've never done that on Christmas morning. They read Luke 2, not 1 Corinthians 15. Right? Charlie Brown, when he said, what's it all about? Linus says, Luke 2. Linus didn't rightly divide. <laughs> Charlie Brown needs to learn something. Charlie Brown's just an average guy just looking for answers. The answer is not in Luke 2. The answer is in 1 Corinthians 15. The, the, the answer is in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. That's where the answer is at. Okay? That's the communication here. And so you see, you, surely you can communicate that with people, with your friends, without 
slapping over the head with pagan traditions and stuff. You know, we know that there's pagan stuff there. We know that it's Roman Catholic and you know they worship Mary and all. But you know, they they just like food and family. They like watching Charlie Brown. All right, let's read the story of Jesus Christ and let's start with his death and resurrection because that's where it starts for you. You see, in Luke chapter two, Jesus Christ was born of a Virgin Mary to fulfill prophecies given to Israel. Praise be to God. But the story does not finish there. Okay. Let's move on to Luke chapter 2. See, finally, you're reading the Christmas story. I wanted to give you all that context in Luke chapter 1 because it's important to understand Luke chapter 2 in the context. <coughs> Luke chapter 2, it came to pass in those days there, were out, there, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. There's the IRS verse right there. If you're an IRS worker, that's your, that's your life verse right there. All the world should be taxed, taxed, taxed. Actually, these two verses tell you uh, when these events are happening. So they're very important if you're one of those, uh, you know, uh, chrono chrono chronological people who, who studied the Bible and the, the dates and the, when it happened. These tell you that this is a historical event. This happened at a specific time, and those are important for those calculations. But in verse 3, all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city, the city of which their family came from. All right. Uh, now, we don't have laws like that now in the church or in our country, but it used to be in Israel there were laws that... Uh, every family was given a piece of land. God promised their land, right? And if people moved out of their land or sold their land, they were required to go back to their land or get their land back ever so many years. That was the law of Israel. So that forever they would have land. There would never be an Israelite that could say, you know what, I had land once, lost it, right? Well, they may, that may have happened a few years, but there would be a time where they would go back to their land. So they'd always get the land. All right. So here David, <coughs> not David, but uh, Joseph and Mary, rather, who were not living in the city that they, were, they came from, had to go back to their city, to the land of their family, of their heritage, to be taxed, because that's how they were collecting the taxes. <coughs> so Luke chapter 2. <coughs> we see the very point of Mary and Joseph going back to Bethlehem is tied to the law and their obedience to it. But in, in Luke chapter 2, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. This tells us something. You ever seen the Christmas cards where you got a few mountains or hills or something, and you got the silhouette of a woman on the donkey, and you got the guy walking the donkey, you know? And it's Mary and Joseph, right, going to their hometown. Well, you know who else went to Bethlehem? Everybody in Joseph's family. Everybody in Mary's family. Because they were of the house and lineage of David. They all went back to Bethlehem to be taxed, you see. So if they had lived in other cities, they all went back home. That's a family gathering right there. That's the Christmas story, right? Families gathering together. Right. That's not what people mean, though. You see, but Luke chapter 2, the picture of Mary and a donkey, you know, nowhere in Luke chapter 2 or Matthew chapter 1, the only two places that talk about Jesus' birth is a donkey mentioned. But, you know, they had to ride something. It wasn't a BMW. So donkeys, right? So this is part of the story that we have nowadays. To be tasked with Mary as a spouse wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the very first night they arrived, knocking on doors, her water's broken. She's, ah, it's, it's a crazy night. No, actually it says while they were there, the days were accomplished, he should be delivered. Apparently, they got there, got settled into their manger, and uh, then the baby happened. You see, that's not very dramatic, is it? Much more dramatic to say, and they traveled over to hills, and she was got ready to give birth, and suddenly they get there, and there's no place, and they're in the street. And that's not what Luke 2 is talking about, but that makes for a good story, I know. That makes for a good story, but that's not what Luke 2 is talking about. While they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son. Matthew chapter 1 talks about Mary giving birth to her firstborn, which seems to imply that she had more than one, right? That word firstborn is taken out of a lot of the Bibles. And then, so they take out the word firstborn, and suddenly you can teach the idea that Mary only had one child ever. And she was a perpetual virgin, because the only baby she ever had was the sinless Jesus. But in the King James Bible, you read about Jesus' brothers and sisters. You read about the firstborn, so maybe there was a secondborn. So she was a perpetual virgin. But I'm going back to the traditions again. I don't want to get there. Luke chapter 2, it says in verse 7, She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Oh, wait a minute. Did we miss a verse? Uh, uh, there should be a verse in there, actually, where Joseph contends with the innkeeper. It must be in another Bible. But that's not in this one. 
He's not talking, going around from end to end going, hey, you got any rooms left? Got any rooms left? Okay. He, there's lots of people coming back to Bethlehem that don't normally live there. And so when your family comes to your house, where do you put them? Well, we got the guest room. We got that closet. And uh, I can make the garage comfortable. Right? That's what's going on in Luke 2. That the rooms are taken up. Joseph and Mary, they're young. We'll put them in the garage. Here's a sleeping bag and a manger. See, that's what's happening here. People tend to seem like the, all of culture is rejecting them. Well, that may be so. But again, this is all the drama that people put into the passage. And what's going on here is that they're going there. There's no room for them in the end. That's a foreshadowing is what that is. That no room for Jesus and his birth is a foreshadowing of Luke chapter 9, verse 58, where Jesus says, in his ministry, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests. Right? What's he say? Luke 9, 58. The birds of the air have their nests, the foxes have their holes, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. What happened in Luke 2 with the no room in the inn is a foreshadowing of Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. That's what that is. Okay? It, it doesn't necessarily mean that Mary was a neglected wife and I need to get the CPS out there. To, uh, no, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus, when he came to God manifest in the flesh, the world was going to reject him. Specifically, his own nation, his own people. The city of Bethlehem. It's foreshadowing that. That's reading too much past the Christmas story, but that, that's what that's talking about there. In Luke chapter 2, uh, then, again, back in verse 8, There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. All people it shall be unto. You know why it shall be unto all people? Because when a king comes to Israel and makes a kingdom in Israel, who gets blessed? All the nations. Genesis chapter 12, the promise to Abraham was, I will bless you and those that bless you. And through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Right? So there's the Christmas story right there, right? That through Israel, America is going to be blessed. Some people believe that still. Right? Going back to Genesis 12. But that's not a Christmas story, is it? That's what Luke 2 is talking about. That it says in Luke 2 verse 10, that... I'll bring you good times of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Okay, Christ the Lord. Christ, that word Christ, has to do with the Messiah. It has to do with Israel's promised Savior. In Isaiah, God says, I'm the Savior. There is no other. God will save his people. And Luke 2 is saying, salvation's coming, people. Salvation's coming. And if you're an Israelite, that means the kingdom's coming. That means judgment's coming, according to Malachi 3 and 4. Right? For 2,000 years, well, not 2,000 years, but way less than that, on millennialists, the Roman Catholic Church, and others who would like to keep their traditions, think that Luke chapter 2 is talking about us today as well, and that salvation is going to all people. Well, salvation is going to all people, but it's the salvation through Christ on the cross, not through Jesus in a cradle. Okay, But Luke chapter 2, in verse 11, unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, versus Christ the Lord. There's about five prophecies fulfilled in Luke 2, 11 right there. The city of David, Micah chapter 4. Christ the Lord, there's about a hundred things prophesying Christ. And unto you is born this day in the city of David to a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah 9, 6, unto you a child is born, a king is given, the prince of peace, wonderful, counselor, almighty God, Isaiah chapter 9. And of the end of his kingdom there will be no end, Isaiah 9, verse 7. So we're living in a time of great Christian prosperity, right? Where God's kingdom is all over the planet. That's why they're cutting people's heads off over there. No, ain't it? So when the angel said in Luke chapter 2, This shall be the sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. That's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. If that's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown, we've been failing. Christmas fails us if that's what Christmas is all about. Because I know we, we love Jesus Christ, we, and you know what? We should love what he did for us on the cross. He's our Savior, as well as Israel's. But Luke 2, verse 14, peace on earth is not here. Okay? Peace on earth is not here, especially when you turn 10 chapters later in Luke chapter 12, verse 51, and you 
hear it from the baby's mouth. The baby who became a man in Luke chapter 12, 51. I know I, I told myself I, I, would, I would not rain on your parade. And I know that saying that there's not peace on earth is a rain. Because the good news today is that you can have peace through Jesus Christ, Romans 5, verse 1, by faith in the gospel, which is that he died on the cross for your sins. He rose again for your, your justification. But there's not peace on earth. There's peace you have with God. That is good news. Preach that, right? But Luke 2 is talking about peace on earth. Luke 12, 51, Jesus said in his earthly ministry to Israel, suppose ye that I came to give peace on earth? Now, I don't know who he's talking to here. Maybe he's talking to the angels, because that's what they said was going to happen. And by the way, they were right, those angels. Peace on earth would come through this king, right? But it did not happen in Luke chapter 2. It didn't happen in Luke chapter 12. It didn't happen in Luke 24 when they killed the Messiah. That's not exactly peace when they killed the king of peace. Not really peaceful there. When Jesus is born and the wise men come and tip King Herod off that the Savior is coming and King Herod kills every baby two years and younger, goodwill toward men. It didn't, it didn't, it wasn't fulfilled then, you understand. Angels were saying that because this is the king that will fulfill it, but it wasn't fulfilled then. And it hasn't been fulfilled for 2,000 years. Jesus was born, that was fulfilled. The kingdom come, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, hasn't happened in 2,000 years. It's a future fulfillment from now, okay? So we can preach this as praise God, he's going to bring his kingdom in of righteousness, but it's not happening today in 2014. It's not happening December 25th, 2014. Okay, so you see there's a context that Luke 2 fits in, and peace on earth isn't what was happening. You say, well, it was that day, that day there was peace on earth. And so every Christmas we stop our fighting, and we stop, you know, we all have peace with each other. Well, that's a great sentiment, and, and, that, and we should do that, be nice to each other, be kind to each other. But, you know, the reality is that the next day is different, next week is different, the next month is different, there's not peace on earth anymore. What people need to hear today, more than that Jesus was born, was that Jesus died for your sins, and he raised again for your justification. That's the gospel salvation they need to hear. Okay? And that's the Jesus Christ we need to preach to them. The Jesus Christ that was only born is not the gospel of salvation. It's incomplete. It's not finished. In Luke chapter 2, we're going back then, try to finish this up. Chapter 2, verse 15. It came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. The shepherds said, Hey, something has come to pass. Something has been fulfilled. Let's go see the fulfillment. Prophecy is not being fulfilled today. It was fulfilled 2,000 years ago on the birth of Jesus Christ, but it's not being fulfilled today. In verse 16, they came with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Verse 18, they heard, all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. The shepherds said there's a Savior born in the city of David today. The Davidic covenant is being fulfilled. A king has come. Salvation is coming. That's what they're saying. The kingdom is coming, right? And they wondered. It was not a silent night, okay? Uh, the shepherds went around telling everybody. And they, they noised it abroad, as it says there, in verse 19, uh, 17 through 20, okay? And in verse 21, of course, we all know after Christmas is when you take your tree out to the street, and you throw all your boxes away, and you circumcise your children, right? Just, ch just check on the list, check on the list, that's all, right? You sweep the floor, clean the dishes, circumcise the baby. Luke chapter 2, verse 21, when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which is so named because of the angel. Why is she circumcising Jesus? Why is Mary offering turtle doves as a sacrifice according to the law of Moses in Luke 2, 22? Perhaps it was because Mary knew nothing about not being under the law, about this Jesus being the sacrifice for her sins and resurrection. She, Mary cried at the crucifixion as every mother should when their child dies before their face. It's horrible. But that means she did not know what Jesus was accomplishing there. Okay, now, I'm not pretending that she should have been jumping for joy. God hid it from her, you see. 
God did not make it known until it was revealed after to the Apostle Paul. I'm just trying to point out the context of Luke 2 is different than the context you and I live in. And so if there's anything that we're to celebrate or anything we're supposed to be making known as the church today, it would not be going back to Luke 2 or Malachi chapter 3 or 2 Samuel chapter 7. It should be preaching the cross of Christ. All right? Should it be doing that? And so when Christians claim that the Christmas story is in Luke chapter 2, what they're saying is that the story isn't finished yet. Isn't that what they're doing? They're taking the gospel that we're supposed to be preaching, cutting off the actual gospel part, and saying, well, I'll just tell you this. I'll tell you about the prophetic fulfillment when our Savior came to Israel, and he was born in a manger. Oh, he was born of a virgin. You know, Hail Mary, right? But what about the actual gospel part that saves people today, his death and resurrection? The story's unfinished. It's the passion without the resurrection. It's the Exodus movie without God's miracles. It's Noah without, well... It's, it's misrepresentation of the Bible, you see. That, that's the offense. Forget the paganism. Forget the Roman Catholicism. Forget the traditions and the commercialism. It's a misrepresentation of the Bible. If you're reading Luke 2, keep reading to Luke 3 and 24. Read the book of Acts. Then read the book of Romans. It'll be a long morning, but when you read the book of Romans, you'll get the gospel. <laughs> right? <laughs> you see how silly it becomes then when Christians say, oh, Christmas is about Jesus. Okay. <laughs> uh, what about him exactly? Because when Christians say it's about Jesus, a lot of things are about Jesus that are wrong. A lot of things are about Jesus that have nothing to do with the gospel that saves you today. Case in point, look at Roman Catholicism. Look at the cults. The Mormons believe in Jesus. The, the Muslims believe in Jesus. There's a lot of things about Jesus that are wrong for us to teach and preach. Paul himself says, I, he worries that you preach another Jesus, right? So, yeah, praise God, honor Jesus Christ, worship him for what he's done for you on the cross. But don't put him back in the, the cradle, don't put him back in the manger. He grew up, okay? He was begotten of God in his resurrection, and he's offering salvation to the world. The birth of Jesus Christ was not a party. It was something that happened to fulfill prophecy. The angels were there to demarcate it, the shepherds were there to witness it, and Mary praised God for fulfilling the Psalms, Okay? But what was much better than that was the cross and resurrection, which only Paul understood after Christ explained it to him. Okay. Charlie Brown says, what's Christmas all about? Well, that's a hard question, Charlie Brown. It's very confusing, and there's lots of different perspectives on Christmas. But you know what the gospel is about? It's Christ dying for your sins and resurrecting. And unfortunately, you don't hear that in Charlie Brown's Christmas. So we, we need a sequel, right? So the, all the Charlie Browns of the world, maybe you're the Charlie Browniest, you know. Uh, you can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? Hopefully you see the importance of that. Any comments, any questions about Luke 1 and 2? I hope I didn't sound so grinchy today. I was trying not to be. Okay. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you for sending him to the earth to put on humanity, to die for our sins, to raise from the dead so that we can have eternal life, so that we can be justified freely, our sins will be forgiven, that we'd have the privilege of communicating this to other people, studying your word and knowing your wisdom, doing your will. Thank you for the folks here this morning, their consistent faithfulness to study your word and to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. Amen. Thank you, folks.